This, this video, video is, is not intended, intended for children. children. Hello everyone. Our topic this week was requested by Aurelio Deprimus, Jeleneth, Pug Allo Entertainment, and Hunter Wegspack. We'll be going over the Overlords and Minions from the Overlord game series. Spoilers for the series as a whole... Le deux. So, the Overlord games all place the player in the shoes of an Overlord, a physically and mystically powerful being with command of creatures called Minions. In a setting that takes a very tongue-in-cheek approach to conducting evil, with bits of genuinely deep thoughts on morality sprinkled in, usually near the end of the games. Mechanically, the player is a big powerhouse with some useful magic spells, but the real fun of the game is in controlling up to a few dozen evil little lemmings at a time as you rise to power, controlling, corrupting, or destroying everything in the player's path. The minions are the player's greatest tool in the fight to lord over the world. They come in four varieties, but each share common traits. Most of them are dumb as rocks, they're small, somewhere between two and four feet or so based upon comparison to other creatures in the game. They're thin and lanky and tend to have a haunched over posture. They are also gleefully, comically, evil. They are capable of some form of reproduction on their own, but in-game, the player literally absorbs the life force of slain creatures and uses that to either call forth old minions or generate new ones. They're also scavengers in the extreme, prone to grabbing anything they deem useful as they ransack their way through the world, using pots for helmets, ornaments for weapons, and everything in between, including actual combat gear, of course. The origins of the minions as a species is somewhat murky, though it is inferred that they come from the Netherworld, a seemingly mystical area that by all accounts is actually just deep beneath the Earth rather than being any sort of extra-dimensional other space. The four varieties of minions are brown, red, green, and blue. Brown minions are by far the most common. They're always the minion type the player starts with, and they are your frontline melee fighters. They do decent damage, but more importantly, are better at taking hits than the rest of your minions. They're also the most visually notable for their looting of the surrounding areas, and will directly show whatever quote-unquote gear they've equipped on their persons, whereas all other varieties will not. Instead, each of the other color types just makes base features, claws for greens, fins for blues, etc., more pronounced in some way. Red minions tend to have a slightly more fiendish appearance, including horns and a tail, but maintain the general minion look overall. Reds are your ranged units. They hurl bolts of fire at your enemies and set things aflame. They're also fire resistant, possibly immune, allowing them to be used to avoid some environmental hazards as well as for puzzle solving. But they are significantly squishier than brown minions. Green minions are stealthy heavy hitters. When used properly, they can turn invisible, allowing the player to set them as traps for unsuspecting enemies literally springing onto the enemy's back to stab them with razor claws when foes are in range. They're also immune to poisonous clouds and the like, allowing them to serve similar puzzle and environmental purposes to the reds. Lastly, the blue minions are the minions' mages or shamans. Shamans, however you want to say it. They can harm foes that are only vulnerable to magic, heal, and actually resurrect fallen minions, etc. In classic mage fashion, blues are the freelest variety of minion by far. They are also the only minion capable of swimming, while all other minions are seemingly negatively capable, drowning instantly when thrown into water. The most important minion in the games, and indeed the only recurring character to appear in every game in some capacity, is the minion master, Narl an aged brown with significantly greater intelligence than his brethren. Narl is the leader of the minions in all but name. Technically, both he and other minions serve the current overlord in particular and the greater forces of evil in general, but Narl always installs himself as an overlord's trusted advisor, and he's always the one who selects a new overlord after the previous overlord vanishes or is slain, making him a much more constant figure than the masters the minions are always seeking. It is unknown how old he is, or whether his age is something all minions are technically capable of reaching, or whether his life has been magically extended. What is known is that he's a constant fixture of the games, and acts as the head of minion society. They go where he says and do what he tells them, which usually consists of either find a new overlord or serve the overlord. Over the course of the series, there have been five known overlords, though we do know there have been others in the past, as during the first game's epilogue, Narl lists off ways he's seen previous masters fall. More ways than we have known overlords. With one exception, they are known simply by their order of appearance. First overlord, second overlord, third, etc. The first known master of the minions is the only one not to bear the title of overlord, and was instead known as the Black Baron. 
Little is known about him except that he ruled the land with an iron fist, enslaving the populace, but ruling intelligently and with order. He was also the uncle of the first overlord. The first overlord is the only one we have a name for. The 16-year-old son of a disgraced duke and nephew to the Black Baron. He would come to be known simply as Lord Gromgard, no first name ever revealed. After the disappearance of the Black Baron, we don't know if he died, left, disappeared, or what, just that he was gone, the Baron's brother, Duke Gromgard, took over the lands in his stead. And while he was not objectively evil, a combination of famines, incompetence, and other disasters led to the slow decline of the kingdom, despite the fact that the populace was now free. The first overlord, hereafter referred to as First, was the youngest of the Duke's three children, with an elder brother and sister, both of whom were equally as evil as First himself. On the day of First's 16th birthday, he received a magical gauntlet, presumably gifted to him either directly by his uncle or by Narl in his uncle's stead, as Narl had awaited First's coming to assume the duties of the newest overlord. Using the gauntlet, First unlocked chambers in their castle that had been sealed away after the Black Baron's disappearance and met Narl, beginning his rise to prominence as the First Overlord. Evidently, which child would replace First's father as successor was unclear, and as such, First's siblings had aligned themselves with foreign powers in order to conquer and secure the dukedom for themselves. His brother sought the aid of the elves, his sister the aid of the dwarves, while First, instead, used the minions to further his aims. First spends his game killing off threats to his kingdom while acquiring the lost minions' nests in order to solidify his power base. The minions are held together primarily by the will of the Overlord and have a bad tendency to scatter to environs they feel comfortable with in the absence of a ruling Overlord, making collection of the nests so that the different minion types can be used a recurring theme throughout the games. Once the people are his and his minion forces are complete, First then pits the elves and dwarves against each other by slaying their respective leaders and planting evidence that the other faction had been responsible, saving his kingdom from invasion by sending the other two nations to war with each other, making First the source of the classically depicted racial distaste elves and dwarves are often depicted showing for each other. The two sides fought for years, somehow led by his siblings in lieu of, I don't know, another elf or dwarf, whatever before First's elder siblings, tired of the fighting, simply returned home to try and claim the Gromgard lands, where they were met by the First Overlord, presumably at the height of his power, and were instead put to work as common laborers or slaves in repairing their ancestral castle. The eventual fate of the First Overlord is unknown, but at some point the Second Overlord, hereafter known as Second, comes to power. Second comes to power and rules in evil for an indeterminate period of time before attracting the attention of the Seven Heroes, a capable group of warriors that sets out to defeat Second. The Seven are joined by an eighth hero somewhere along the way, and together, the eight of them battle and seemingly defeat the Second Overlord. Though the eighth hero fell from the top of the tower and was left for dead during the fight. All was not as it seemed, however. The leader of the Seven Heroes was a man simply known as the Wizard, a powerful and virtuous old magician. After the Second Overlord fell in combat, he possessed the Wizard, taking control of his body and impersonating him. After the heroes left the tower, certain of their victory, Second had Gnarl and his loyal minions revive the dead, or perhaps just mostly dead, Eighth Hero, and groom him to become a sort of puppet Overlord. The revivification process took a number of years, and during that time, Second, in the guise of the wizard, used the wealth and prestige the Seven had gained to help him corrupt each of the Seven heroes until each of them essentially embodied one of the Seven Deadly Sins. When the Eighth Hero arose as the Third Overlord, hereafter referred to as Third, he had no memories of his past life or his confrontations with Second. He was merely told by Narl that his predecessor had been slain by the Seven Heroes who were still at large and would stand in the way of his rise to power. So, Third proceeded to wipe out five of the Seven Heroes, ironically freeing the regions they controlled from whatever form of corrupted evil the once heroes ruled with. A gluttonous halfling had enslaved a nearby town for a workforce to satisfy his hunger. A paladin fallen to sins of the flesh had cheated on his fiancée, created a sex cult, and unknowingly caused a zombie outbreak. A tired elf had fallen into slothful slumber and his nightmares had taken physical form to butcher and terrorize his homeland. A greedy dwarf enslaved the elves that escaped those nightmare lands to toil in his mines and make him rich. A giant of a man wrathfully slaughtered his way across the countryside with a band of marauders. An envious thief stole that which others most covet, only to find that she had no interest in the things herself. The third overlord slew all but the thief who was imprisoned in his dungeons, with third taking control of those lands and kingdoms in the wake of the once heroes. With the game letting you choose to make terribly evil decisions or more pragmatically long-term, almost heroic decisions about what to do with those places in the aftermath. Though, 
still relatively evil. Along the way, Third encounters the two daughters of the real wizard, one representing that more pragmatic evil, the other the more debaucherous face of evil. The player picks one to be his evil mistress, leaving the other sister to knowingly help her father, second, in the body of the wizard to lure Third into a trap, culminating in a showdown at the tower between the two overlords. Here, second reveals his plans to Third with great relish and pride informing Third that he'd done his job in rebuilding Second's lost power base very well, but that it was time for things to be returned to their proper owner. The two engage in a great battle, minions fighting for both sides, before eventually Third stood victorious. Given little time to rest, Third then found his lands infested with portals to various hell dimensions, and proceeded to enter and conquer each of them, finding the various once heroes suffering punishments in the afterlife befitting the sin that allowed to dominate the last years of their lives, before finally facing a forgotten god, who had been sealed away in one of those hell dimensions and was creating the portals to try and escape. Third defeated the god, but was trapped in the hell dimension, the portal collapsing in the wake of the forgotten god's death. Or possibly being sabotaged by one of his minions, as there were scenes inferring the possibility that one of the minions had been possessed by Second after his defeat at Third's hands. Alternatively, that particular minion was known to just not like Third as much as Second, meaning it's possible he sabotaged Third of his own volition. This left Third trapped in the Hell Dimension. But the creatures of those worlds, the Wraiths, pledged their loyalty to him as he'd been the one to defeat the god that they had once served. Which is where the Third Overlord's story ends, with vague hintings of his possibly finding a way free one day. But before being trapped in that Hell Dimension, Third's Mistress of Evil was found to be pregnant. She would eventually bear the Fourth Overlord, who apparently some of the fan community refers to as Overlad, which is hilarious, and as such, that's what we're calling him. Overlad wouldn't come to power for another 20 or so years, but in that time, a lot happened. His mother, knowing the power in her son and fearing he'd share a similar fate to his father if he followed in that path, left the minions and dropped her son off in the middle of a town in the frozen north before running off to become an advisor to a rising human kingdom. That kingdom was ironically founded by an elf, pretending to be human and pushing a crusade against all magical creatures. Including elves. Cause he sucks. His true goal was to gather all of the magical energy of those magical beings and use it to ascend to godhood. But he had preyed upon the people's fears of magic and made it out to be a simple purge. The irony here is that the people feared magic because of an enormous magical explosion that that very elf had caused when he accidentally destroyed one of the third overlord's major artifacts while trying to tap its power. During the 20 years before Overlad's game begins, that elf plays both sides, acting as a supporter for a fey queen that was gathering and protecting other magical creatures under his real name, while capturing and slaying those same creatures and expanding his empire under the guise of the Emperor. For Overlad's part, he spent his first few years of life as a child in that northern village, shunned for his magical talent, before being found and raised by the minions for most of his life, groomed to be a proper overlord of evil. When the time was right, Overlad began conquering the land, starting with his old village home. Where his father had the choice between handling things in an evil or almost good way, Overlad's choices are more evil-focused and instead differentiate between dominating and ruling his conquered lands or destroying and devastating them. As the game goes on, Overlad conquers land belonging to both the Empire and magical creatures, slaughtering and or dominating his way across the landscape until arriving at the capital of the Empire. There, the Emperor's plan is revealed, as he tries to absorb all the magical energy he's collected over the past several years. Only to take on the form of a massive, magical, worm monster. Which Overlad eventually defeats. With the Emperor slain, those magic reserves spent, and most meaningful forces routed to get there, Overlad then had plenty of time to establish his evil domain. We don't know how long he lasted, but Overlad was eventually overthrown by the Order of Shining Justice, an organization that grew to considerable size and was actually led by a unicorn, who is said to have been the creature who personally slew Overlad. We call BS, by the way. Regardless of the truth of the story of Overlad's demise, the minions were in trouble. Playing into the goofy undertone the games always had, they were terrified of a magical... plague that the unicorn was spreading, dubbed the Golden, which basically brought life and vigor to all natural environments, but also cutified any creatures, minions included, caught in the effect. The minions were in no way prepared to accept this, and without any overlord appearing, the minions decided to speed up the process. Under the orders of Gnarl, they searched for and found the Big Book O' Evil. Yes, really and then used it to revive four powerful evil beings who'd recently died. 
A flame-wielding warrior who'd lived her whole life on her own and butchered anything in her path. A necromancer who had burned out her own life force to wipe out an entire legion of shining justice soldiers that had come to slay her. As well as an elven prince gifted with ice magic and a dwarven captain of a mercenary outfit called the Utter Bastards, who'd killed each other during battle. Narl and the minions dubbed these four as Overlord Candidates, and used them to dismantle the Shining Justice as a series of tests to see who was worthy to become the next Overlord. The game doesn't give us an answer... at all. But hey, like Narl says, evil always finds a way. And that's basically the story of the minions and overlords from the Overlord series. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like and maybe share it with someone you know might like it. If you have ideas for videos you'd like to see in the future, do like Aurelio Dupremus, Jeleneth, Pug Allo Entertainment, and Hunter Wegg's Pack, and let us know in the comments down below. If you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, be they lore, let's play, or other, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, this has been True, True Masters and, and Morons, signing, signing off. off. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to see more like it, hit that subscribe orb. To see our last Let's Play, click or tap the link on the right. For our last lore video, click the link on the left. Thank you to all of our patrons for making these videos possible. Thanks, Thanks for watching, watching and, and we'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.